Hello and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Journalist Hangouts, your number one news and current affairs program on television. I'm Ayoli Uzubakun. Today on the show, hundreds trapped as Bogwaram hoist flags in Mate, Brownu State. Senate demand arrest of NDDC boss for shunning its invitation over six billionaire palliative four times. And later on the program, tension brews over appointment of court of appeal as politicians hijack lists. I'll be joined by Babaji De Koladi Otitoju and Olabisi Deji Folutile. So if you're ready, let the hangout start now. Thank you for staying with us. Hundreds of people have been trapped in towns and villages in Mate local government in Brno State, northeast Nigeria, after Boko Haram militant captured Mate and hoisted the flag as symbol of their authority. The development has pushed the army leadership to challenge the troops to recapture the territory. This is one of the most recent and daring attacks by militants in recent time. So what has changed with the change of guard that's in the army. Babajide, right now, yesterday we saw the chief of army staff giving like a go ahead, like a marching order to his troop to march to Mate. And we we're talking about how strate um, strategic Mate is and how it's going to be difficult for our troops to that terrain because I was told that they even have sympathizers within the, the, that local government, the Boko Haram element. Well, the, the truth is, apart from the local government headquarters, the, the rest of the area had been controlled by Boko Haram until recently when they began to push hard to take complete control of Mate town itself. Um, the truth is, the governor is bent on bringing people to that local government because of um, uh, <coughs> the significance of that local government in terms of his own agenda of boosting the economy of the state. So he relocated about 500 uh, families to Marte. As soon as he did that, the terrorists began to make their move to totally take control of that area. Because, as I said earlier, most part of that local government, apart from the local government headquarters where you have the presence of the army, had been in the hands of the terrorists. So for the governor to be making moves to relocate people to that place, the terrorists must have felt that what is going on. And they just felt that, look, if we launch these attacks, then they won't be able to settle people in that area. And that kind of strategy had worked in the past because when people were relocated to Guzamala local government, Boko Haram came, slaughtered the people, killed the soldiers who were there, and the, the military decided not to send soldiers back there, and people decided not to go and live in, uh, in uh, Guzamala local government. That's why till today there's no single soul there. So the attention is clear for the governor that place is significant for the growth of wheat and for the growth of rice. So he wants the people to come back. But these terrorists do not want that to happen. And Apparently the place is still not secured enough. There is no, no doubt about it. Uh, look at a town like uh, Krenoa, which is the hometown of the uh, current Nigerian ambassador to China. The man has not gone home since 2014 because it's a no-go area. And it's part of the places that the, the chief of army staff said the, the soldiers must go and clear. By, by saying go and clear, he's saying that he does not want to see those terrorists back there. 
But what is crucial for us is to um, have the luck of good weather. Because the terrorists launch their attack in the night, knowing that at that time the weather is usually very bad. The Sahelian weather, uh, full of dust and haze. So the army couldn't benefit from uh, air cover. So the terrorists came with about 17 gun trucks and they totally overwhelmed the army. Our troops had to had to retreat to the quad 25 kilometers away. Equipments. Everything. Everything. That's what they do. Their main agenda when they attack military bases is to steal weapons. No, no, they have no plan to stay there and hold that place for long. I guess this one is just a way of sending a message that look, we are not as weak as you think we are. We can overrun military bases and stay there for long. So mm -hmm. that's the it's embarrassing, and I'm not surprised that the new chief of army staff ran down to Bono State to set a timeline for his troops. You see, when they come within our territory and they hoist their flag, it's saying something about you know what they are trying to do within our territory. It's simple. It's saying uh, it's a it's an authority language. It's a way of saying we have taken over this place. We are in charge here. We are in control. And uh, from what has been happening now, we can see that already the locals in these towns are taking, you know, instructions from the Boko Haram. They've taken over government installations there. They've taken over the mosque. They, the, are, they even have sympathy they, of some of the residents. Exactly. And they've taken over you know nearly everything of course everything and uh, you can imagine is that as a result of absence of you know governance even even the military installation in that place they've taken over they've taken it over hmm. so it's not a question i think it's uh, is a question of uh, overpowering our own uh, military truth you know one way or the other it's just a pure case of Boko Haram having an upper hand over our troops because you need it takes a power a, a more powerful hand to def uh, you know to take over a territory that belongs to you so it's not as if uh, because there are military installations there and right now we learned that they've taken over even the weapons, all the vehicles, all the armories and the rest. So which means that it's not as if the Nigerian government neglected that place. In fact, uh, I learned they've been attacking that area between October and this year six times. Boko Haram has launched attacks six times and they've been repelled. And uh, also, they've been launching the attack from a particular side. But this time around, they changed their tactics, mm. which came to the, uh, you know, the troops probably as a surprise. Probably they've over-concentrated efforts in the particular area where they've been launching the attacks from, and uh, which made it to be so overwhelming and the rest, and to the extent yeah, that they yes. have to retreat so it's not a question of uh, we not having presence there it's just a question of the need for our military to probably build more capacity in order to be able to get these people and don't forget the fact that uh, these areas are very important to boko haram for different reasons for one these are areas with very porous borders where they can easily come in from bring in their shipment, the chart and uh, you know bring in whatever they want to do it's a place where they can easily take control over so it makes it a good place for them to actually launch their attacks on other parts of the northeast so it's like a competition between boko haram and nigerian troops for these areas and really what we need to do is to encourage our troops
Mm. Not to discourage them, not to think that they've not been fighting or they've not been working, you know, but just to encourage them to go back again and do more. Because remember, seven soldiers were said to have been killed, even in this mm. attack. Early attack. Yeah. You can, ultimately, when you look at the way these guys operate, now they are now proving so stubborn and formidable. I don't know what we can use. Maybe uh, we would need deployment of more air power to dislodge them. But talking about ground troops, talking about you know uh, what we have on ground, they are always coming back, always coming back. The, the, the truth is, under the um, current leadership of the armed forces, you can see um, some level of cohesion. They are working together. But the Air Force itself is limited in terms of its capacity to help the Army. You are limited by natural causes. If the weather does not favor um, an operation by the Air Force, they are not going to be airborne. This is similar to what happened in Baga in, um, in uh, January. Uh, 2019, when Boko Haram overran the multinational joint tax force headquarters in Baga, the Air Force could not assist the army to, to, to repel them because the weather was bad. Many people will sometimes wonder how, how, how did it happen. But the truth is the Air Force is known to have assisted even in this matter on a number of occasions that they attempted to take over that army base. The, the, the Air Force responded promptly. But the weather is very bad at this time. Because the question to ask yourself is, how come we have not chased them away from the place? But the weather hampered any form of uh, response by the Air Force. And while the weather remains as bad as it is, they are coordinating and sending more men to the area to secure the area, make it difficult for the army to, to, to take How over. How do they get more people? Of course, they have, they have their bases not far away from those areas. When we say that Boko Haram, especially in Sambisa, you see them show evidence that, yes, this was their base. You saw even the, some of their, uh, their motorbikes and all that, that the army recovered. The truth is, that whole area, you know that, but no not, has always been an area where Boko Haram is very strong. There are very few communities in the whole of B Bono North. You can count them on your fingertips where you will find people. There are very, very few communities where people are residing in the whole of Bono North. Mm -hmm. Ten local governments, very few places where you can find people. So ungoverned spaces, just like the former chief of army staff said, there are too many ungoverned spaces in Bono State. Mm -hmm. And these boys operate from a lot of those places. So they can move, they can move from their, their strongholds to reinforce an area of uh, interest to them that they have taken over. Now we have to do our best to outflank them, either coming in from Mafa local government or simply secure Mafa and ensure that they do not overrun Mafa. Because if they overrun Mafa, they are going to Maiduguri because it's not far from there. So it, the ultimate objective is to push them completely away from that area and secure that whole area up to uh, Mafa and Dikwa so that we can keep that area safe. Many times, you can see even this same, I think about two weeks ago, they went to uh, Kalabalge local government. And in Kalabalge, it is only run, run town. The headquarters of Kalabagi that you will find people uh, living. Oh, you have IDP. Yes, there are IDP camps where mm -hmm. they uh, kidnap those uh, mid midwives mm -hmm. and later kill them. It's uh, close to the border with Cameroon. They, they went there, disloyed troops. But the quick response of the Air Force ensured that they could not achieve their aim of looting weapons again. So I uh, remember the last time they went to Marte when the army claimed that. It made a tactical uh, retreat as a way of uh, luring them in. They had taken over the, 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 the base. 
but the Air Force launched three wave of attacks and exterminated all of them right there at the base mm -hmm. so that they were unable to escape with the weapons that they came to steal. So this is the thing. In one month, three attacks. By the time they launched the third attack, they, they recorded success. Ultimately, whether they like it or not, they will be pushed out of Mate. But this sends a clear signal to us that there's a lot of work that we must do. I was discussing with my friend, Engineer Priye Aganaba. I said, when he posted something on social media, I said, let's temper our optimism. Because immediately we see some pictures of soldiers jubilating, either in Sambisa, that uh, Shekau's uh, farm had been overrun. We start telling ourselves that we are close to victory. When the Chadians overran them in their own territory the other day, we started thinking that victory had come. Mm -hmm. Some people were even abusing me that, oh, that when uh, we are close to victory, you don't open your mouth. That's April 2020. We are in, we are close to March 2021 now. We have still not secured total victory, the kind of victory that we want. We must temper our optimism and realize that there's still a lot of work left undone. Mm -hmm. Victory will come when we stay focused and stop underrating the enemy. We should stop thinking that this and oh, they are actors, they do, uh, most of the time they don't wear shoes. No. But the will to die, they are ready to die. They are ready to put their lives on the line. And they have weapons. A lot of them stolen from us. I'm and some this. coming all the way from Libya. So we should not underrate the enemy. We should realize that, look, we must stay focused and ensure that victory comes ultimately. This is, the, this is what I believe we have to, to, to do. Busy. A lot of people will argue and they will tell you that, look, it's easier for these people to recruit because they lay up people with money, they are well funded, and in most of those areas, they've been abandoned by the government of Nigeria, but there's no presence of governance there. So most of the time, when you get to see them, you see youths that are jobless, unemployed, they're moving around, no hope for tomorrow. And mm. this is the kind of thing you get. It's obvious that uh, government has failed in its uh, responsibilities to a, to a very large extent. But then, the government just did not fail in the Northeast alone. It is across the country. And uh, I think there is a peculiar case in the Northeast area because of the closeness to neighboring countries where these uh, terrorists can actually operate from. So I, if uh, we realize a problem, but unfortunately, I think uh, it's rather too late. You get it? Because if the troops have captured, like he explained, that only a few places in these areas even have a presence of uh, human beings, human beings as per Nigerians. Let me put it that way. If most of them have been occupied, you know, by the terrorists in the first instance, it's really difficult to just ask them. The best thing would have been for them not to take a route, but now they've taken root. So if you are even talking about, growing. yes, they keep growing. If you are talking about socio-economic programs, who do you now plan those programs for? Mm. Are you planning programs for people that are, that are now under siege? You know, they even re they relaunched this attack. They claim these areas as soon as possible. That is the main task. And I also think that um, the Air Force uh, jets and the rest, he spoke about weather conditions. Shouldn't there be technologies that could be applied in these kind of situations, maybe in terms of the kind of uh, fighter jets that we procure that could take care of situations of bad weather? Because if we don't uh, solve that problem, it means that this is going to be a continuous thing because weather will always be bad at certain times of the year. Do we now say that the, the troops, tools. you know, we, we, we leave our territories to them to, you know, take control over? We need to take care of this area. There are times when 
um, the ground troops enjoy their work. There are times when they don't. When it is raining, for example, you cannot enjoy fighting as an infantry unit. You can't enjoy fighting in Maiduguri, in Borno State, because of the texture of the land. A lot of their uh, heavy armament, they are, they are gone, um, what is it called? They are armored fighting vehicles. APC. Get stuck in the mud. Okay. Don't, when it is during the rainy season, yeah. so you can't advance rapidly. But during that time, the Air Force can be very effective. But when we are in the peak of the Amatan, with the dust, with the haze, everything, that's not the best time for the Air Force. That's why the, the, the Army enjoys the Air Force more when the weather is very favorable. And it's not every, um, every fighter jet that is equipped for um, night fighting. It's not every every uh, jet that is uh, on our in our uh, inventory that is equipped to fight with, uh, night fighting capability. So, and even when they are ready, maybe at that time the army is not ready to launch an attack because they have to do it together, and then the air force will provide close air support. If at this time the air force is ready to fly, they won't simply just go and be dropping bombs anyhow. The, the, the operation has to be coordinated, and that is the responsibility of the Chief of Defense Staff, because when they have this joint operation, it's, yeah. it's usually under his command. Yeah. So they have to uh, find the right time to launch that attack simultaneously. Those of them who are trying to escape, the job of the Air Force to with their up. helicopters is to make sure that they are strapped. So I'm confident that um, we will be able to push them out of Marte, but who knows where they will go next after Martin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on now. The Senate Committee on Ethics, Privileges and Public Petitions has issued a warrant of arrest to the interim head of the troubled Niger De Delta Development Commission, that's NDDC, Efiang Okun Oka, for failing to honor the panel's invitation. The committee had summoned the NDDC boss to offer explanation on 6.2 billion naira the commission spent on COVID-19 palliatives, but why has Efiong Oka shunned the invitation four times? Babajide, <laughs> 6.2 billion naira. NDDC, NDDC again on <laughs> palliatives, COVID-19 palliatives. Actually, I was surprised to hear that this new man that the Senate has issued a, um, a warrant of arrest for the new um, sole administrator of the NDDC. One, not because I am suddenly convinced that um, the NDDC has suddenly become immune to corruption. I still think that um, it is a cesspool uh, for corruption to tomorrow. But in my view, uh, the, this six billion plus uh, money for palliatives was not received by him. And the money was not spent by him. Is the last administration, the last interim management committee, Ponde, the Ponde led IMC was the one that received that money. The president gave that approval, you know, early last year. It was Ponde's team that received the money. Now, why are you inviting this new man? This new man came just recently and you approved his budget. You approved the budget that I presented. It came to you people who said, I don't want to do any uh, extra uh, budgetary or uh, on uh, spending that is not appropriate. Please approve speedily uh, uh, my, budget. Uh, my budget. And you did it. Why didn't you bring up this issue at that time? I, I, I can see that somebody wrote a petition. The person was supposed to monitor 
the palliatives and other, how they were distributed, did they petition to the Senate. But again, the Senate probed the Ponday led IMC. Was it not contained in their recommendations that these guys should be prosecuted for the way they spent the, the money that was yes because the the president simply approved the money okay. in the own case they 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 are they awarded all kinds of contracts in the name of uh, covid-19 some um, for sensitization and all that just throwing money around during that period they claimed that they did the medical test for staff the same country to the tune of about four billion hmm. just spend the money anyhow 11.9 million within a, a period of like six weeks or so just extra judicial spending that they did so what is the recommendation of the senate committee that investigated the ponde led IMC during which the man uh, dramatically collapsed. Mm. What if it was contained in that uh, recommendation that this guy should be prosecuted, that uh, they should be investigated and not and prosecuted? Will this petition uh, come up? There will be no need for this petition. So I suspect that even the National Assembly, the lawmakers themselves, were not um, transparent enough in the way they handled the investigation of the NDDC. Because I'm yet to hear that, okay, this is the outcome. I'm yet to hear that the FCC has been told to move in and ensure prosecution. Yet. We just saw, those, we just saw the, 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 the dramatic yes, part that time. Yet. Watching even live this, TV, the, even the minister himself, the mm. minister owned up that he issued some queries on account of some um, uh, illegal uh, spending of money. This new man claimed that he had to write to the president to cancel 400 desilting contracts. 400. Desilting is the way by which money is stolen at NDDC. Mm. They say, oh, we are desilting this, this uh, 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 river mm. here. We are doing this. So 400 is a lot. It's a lot. All right. We have to take this break. When we come back, we'll talk more. It's still generally stand out. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. Now, we are still looking at the crisis within the Niger Delta Development Commission. And in a long time since this commission was established, it has always been the same story. Yeah, I in agree. In terms with of him. development, nothing to write home about, but in terms of making news for the negative reasons. <laughs> it's as if the commission is established for corruption. That is the impression you get that uh, is a way of settling some people that are in charge there. And that region that I meant to take care of. Care of. of. It has remained like that streets. forever. You go to the communities. There are so many communities in those areas that don't have water up to now. Basic amenities. Basic amenities. There are so many community, communities that do not even have roads. At all. And these are the things that the commission is expected to take care of. In fact, uh, there was a report recently by the commission by the United Kingdom on uh, how politically uh, exposed uh, people spent government money to send their children to school mm. abroad in private schools. And uh, in that report, it specifically mentioned NDDC as being a cesspool for corruption, so to say, in that imagine during lockdown, this NDDC 
voted money for graduation in UK universities that they sent people. They said they paid money to some of their management staff to attend graduation ceremony that never held. There were no planes, there, you know, the air, uh, there was no flight, nothing. Yet they collected this money. Those were some of the things the National Assembly was asking questions from the Ponde led ESCO, ESCO that decided to faint during the interrogation and up to now. That, are, that is the only thing that we have heard about them. So I, I, I also think that um, the way the National Assembly is approaching this matter is giving people the impression that uh, it is not taking issues, it is not performing its oversight um, functions expectedly. Mm -hmm. As diligently as the, it should be. For instance, this is the man that just came in. Okay? Now you are asking him to come over. For him to even disobey you four times, I think that is a message. For him to disobey four times, it's sending a strong message that you cannot, you don't know what you are doing. You will be arrested. Uh, now they are saying that it will be arrested. Do we? I don't even think uh, we need uh, the permission. The National Assembly needs Nigerians' permission to issue a warrant of arrest if he should be arrested. But then the issue is this: during the probe of the Ponde-led uh, ESCO, we heard a lot of things about this same palliative. How members of staff even got money you know, as uh, palliatives, running into millions of naira and the way they share their money at that time. And nothing, nobody was brought, nobody was, uh, you know, um, there is no legal action, so to say, taken against any of these uh, people that were accused of uh, misspending the commission's money. And these are the issues that we need to look at, not just uh, issuing warrants of arrest. And Im imagine now, even the members of the Senate, they are in Port Harcourt, probably meeting the same man that they are asking to come and appear before them in their so-called oversight functions. It, we, the National Assembly really needs to show itself to be working for the people and not give room for people to probably accuse them Judith, of... Um, you know, finally on this, mm -hmm. I will say, from what we saw through, uh, during the last probe, mm -hmm. we discovered that this thing is not even limited to the NDC um, board alone. Even it was confirmed that some people, some individuals in the National Assembly, they get contracts from this same commission. So it will be very, very difficult in looking at their papers and objectively indicting whoever is found culpable. How they can indict from what we have seen about these guys. It's not even simply about National Assembly members uh, collecting contract because the minister made that allegation but he couldn't prove it and um, he was challenged to prove it. Why he couldn't? Why he refused to publicly prove it? I don't understand. And even the chairman of the uh, select committee that he claimed got contract at that time, he had not even won election into the House of Reps. So it was a silly allegation to make. Address the issues before you, and these issues, these ones, it just is clear that. They were just looking for ways of taking money out. You were still struggling to defend your budget. And within the space of five weeks, you spent 19.6 billion. All kinds of funny contracts. You need to see some of the contracts that these people give out. And for the new man to say that he had to cancel 400 desilting contracts, that's to tell you how many of those contracts they, they, they actually came up with. Contracts that were either never executed or shortly executed, but you release money all the same.
you paid yourself you paid yourselves from money that was meant for scholarship of students in foreign schools you shared the money to yourselves and they could not they could not defend themselves during the during the during the probe we saw clearly that this was an agency of government that needed to be sanitized what did we get a ridiculous uh, attempt at auditing whereby someone who should actually himself be investigated is the one appointing auditor and the the president has also not helped matters because the, the Senate committee that investigated um, came up with some recommendations. They said, see, let the supervision of the NDDC go back to the presidency. Do not allow the minister of Niger Delta to combine it with his work. That's not what the act setting up the NDDC said. You have gone against the, this is, people are saying, oh, but the president can delegate. Now you've delegated, and the, the, the minister himself has been accused severally. So you've got to take some decisions. Let the, nation, the, 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 the national auditor, our own auditor, the auditor general of the federation, let him be the one conducting the auditing of the NDDC. Not for uh, uh, the board of the NDDC to go and appoint an audit firm. I mean, there's no, that one does not guarantee transparency. So all kinds of things are wrong. By the time we go, we check, now we have, what do we have? We have a sole administrator running such a behemoth, one, an individual. Where is that done? That means we are not ready to defeat corruption within the NDDC. That means we like what is going on there. And what is going on there is, uh, is, is just like a buffet. And it is during buffets that you see how greedy Nigerians can be Come because people will fill their plates with what they cannot finish. The competition. <laughs> and finally, the tension in Nigerian judiciary has controversy brews over appointment of the Court of Appeal after indications emerged that some politicians have hijacked the coveted lists. Legal and judicial experts have described the list as being dominated by candidates nominated or sponsored by politicians. <laughs> you see? You see, uh, the problem with us is that uh, we want to corrupt every of our system. There are laid down terms and regulations for appointment of officers, of you know judges, into courts of appeal. It's well laid down. It's it, it's we are starting today, but once we decide that we don't want the rule of law, then we go for anything. And uh, for me, politicians can aspire to do anything. Politicians can decide to corrupt any system. But if we, there must be a system, uh, uh, the rule of law must be respected. And how do we achieve that? when we have abandoned everything we have we have made nigeria to look like a few a free feast for everybody to just come and do whatever they like how come that the judicial commission is so powerless even right now yes how come they are so power powerless now it means that they have been infiltrated by even politicians, justices, and judges. Do you get it? And uh, if we are, when once we allow ourselves to get to this point, anything can happen. Because for me, politicians look at uh, Donald Trump in the U.S. He attempted a lot of things after his election, after he lost. He attempted to do a lot of things, but because the systems, you know, they allow the rule of law to prevail, mm -hmm. even members of his own party couldn't help him at a time. Mm -hmm. Because you just have to allow the rule of law to direct your activities as a nation, as a society, which is highly lacking 
in our system now. If you look at the list that was sent, there are some names of people that were not even so that were there. This, I learned that they removed the names of the original people that are supposed to be on the list. Yes, that and they now replace them with their own political friends just because they are looking for people that will be able to help them to do their business. We, sh we should. Hmm. <laughs> I take this break. When we come back, we'll talk more. We're still, journalist and guys, we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're still looking at the judiciary. Babajide, hmm, this is dangerous. Attempt to politicize our judiciary. Yes, and uh, we are increasingly downplaying the most important qualities that you want to see in a judge. Um, qualities like integrity, Honesty, elocution, brilliance. In fact, the based on the NJC's recommendation, federal character comes last mm. in the list of considerations in choosing judges for our courts. But what do we see? We are actually bringing what should come last, first. as the first. And the concern is uh, of the um, organization of Nigeria is that the judges are pointed out uh, on the list of judges for the Court of Appeal from Northern Nigeria. Uh, there is not a single Christian. How did we arrive at that? Are they saying that no Christian was recommended? What we should actually be doing is look at the list of judges that the president of the Court of Appeal recommended. These are people, she, she works with them, she knows them more than the, the politician. But what do we have? You have, we have a situation in which politicians are going ahead to change the list of the NJC the, uh, and, and uh, mm. the list provided by the president of the Court of Appeal. She's the one who will work with them. There's no reason the president of the Court of Appeal will nominate someone. That person comes first on his list, maybe from a particular state. You now remove that person completely and put someone else. It's only in our country that this sort of nonsense can happen. Politicians are extremely greedy. They want to corner everything, corner our commonwealth. Now even the, the, our, the judiciary, they want to totally destroy it. This is a judiciary that in itself has lost its reputation. The way we used to speak glowingly about those great judges, mm. Oputa, Aniagolu, and the rest of them. So, is, is there any judge today that his name comes to your mind as, as a judge that can really compete with those people? Because we have allowed politics to destroy everything. People are not competent. People can't even write, judge, write judgments by themselves. Some, some of them won't sleep during uh, court proceedings. Those are the people that we are putting in the forefront. And a great judge must have some qualities. You must see those qualities in the great judge. But if we continue to brush aside those qualities, and we are going for religion, we are going for uh, uh, ethnicity, we are going for uh, your catchment area, and all that. We will not.
be able to find the judiciary of our, of our dream. He won't. We are going to litter our courtrooms with incompetent, thoroughly incompetent and conscienceless judges. That's what we are going to have. That's very dangerous. Because they are not going to do beyond their capacity. Someone who ought not to be somewhere, you put him there. What do you expect? Police. They are just looking for people who will do their bidding. Oh, so that when I'm in, um, in, uh, in a position when I need a judge, this court of appeal judge can. I don't know why we focus so much on damaging the court of appeal. What was the, the problem? Does this, why do we have this struggle? I, 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 I don't think it's even about the court of appeal or the judiciary alone. I think our politicians focus on damaging every uh, system, every sector of our nation. And uh, you just wonder what goes on in their brains, really. Uh, and I can also understand what goes on there. What goes on there is simply because as far as they are concerned, they just, they are living for themselves. They are not about the society. They are not about the people. But then I ask this question, whose responsibility is it to appoint court of appeal judges? When did it become the responsibility of politicians to begin to appoint uh, judges? I thought that responsibility should be for the NJC. How, how did that function leave the NJC and now is now the, into the get into the hands of politicians? So mm. that is what we should also query. And that is why I said earlier on that even the NJC itself mm. has been politicized. Even what what they have point. done is to go through the the Federal Judicial Service Commission. That is where the politicians have so much influence. That's where they've gone to to alter the list and almost brush aside the the list that the, the president of the court of appeal painstakingly put together. I mean, it's such a shame. Hmm. All right, we have to leave it there. Thank you, Allah BC for Thank you for your contribution today. Thank you. thank you. And BKO, thank you for always being there. And that's our package today. Join us tomorrow for another episode of the program. Remember, you can also watch Journalist Hangout Sunday edition from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. We're on YouTube, youtube.com slash TVC News Nigeria. My name is Ayodele Welcome. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria. <laughs>